The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture. See it there on the screen behind me. Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. We'll be reading verses 38 through 50 there this morning. Mark chapter 9, beginning with verse 38, reading there through the end of the chapter, verse 50. John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him. For no one who does a good deed of power in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. For truly I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell where the worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O God, we pray for ears to hear, eyes to see, hearts open to receive what you have for us this day through the words of Holy Scripture. Help us, Lord, to receive it to take it into ourselves so that we may live more and more in the way of Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, nearly 30 years ago, I guess this week, this month, in the fall of 1989, I was in the first few weeks of a lifelong journey of learning and education in Miss Webb's kindergarten class at Wyndham Elementary School in Daleville, Alabama. Little did I know, though, that about 200 miles away, over 600 people would pack themselves into a room not fit for 600, dedicated or decorated with stained glass and appointed with nice furniture, wooden furniture. And they came in order to, at least in some of their minds, to determine the fate of some of their friends, some of their partners, some of you. Because some of you were there. I don't know if you knew this or not. I suspect at least one person in this room remembers that 30 years ago this past Tuesday, on September 25th of 1988, this church elected, to, uh, ser- to, elected two women to serve as deacons. Peggy Hamby, and the late Dean Norton. Thirty years ago, it was a decision that caused a little bit of an uproar with the Calhoun Baptist Association that led to a vote to disbar this church from the association. One of the pastors present at that meeting, I won't tell you his name, I won't tell you what church it was, but I think it's on the crest of a hill, um, You all pick up what I'm putting down? Okay. One of the pastors who was there addressed the messengers. These are the people who were officially recognized to get to cast the votes. He said, God created man to be the head of the house. And the Bible says a deacon is to rule his own house. That would mean that if a woman was elected a deacon, she'd have to rule over her husband. I wonder who ruled over who in that house. Not making any guesses. 
But in his mind, that meant that our church's decision was unbiblical. Had gone against the teachings of Scripture. In fact, he went down a litany of all the Bible verses that showed why women shouldn't do anything but cook and be quiet and that sort of thing. When the vote was taken, 331 messengers voted to expel our church from the Calhoun Baptist Association. I think it's worth noting that 269 voted to keep us. I think that's worth noting. But just prior to that vote, Lee Messer, a lot of y'all know Lee, a former member of this church, deacon, longtime lay minister here, said these words. You can find it. I'm just going to do a little plug. You can find it in our history book. I believe it's $25 in the church office. <laughs> if you'd like to buy it there. You want to read the whole story. But Lee said this. Regardless of tonight's action, the vote, we will continue to support the Calhoun Baptist Association through our gifts, service, and prayers in the collective evangelical and humanitarian goals of the association. Our church has and will continue to promote the, quote, harmonious working together of churches, end quote, within the association. We will continue to aspire with the guidance of the Holy Spirit to consummate our objectives of reaching people, discipling believers, and strengthening missions both at home and abroad. We ought to chisel that on the cornerstone of the chapel. Now, I wasn't there. Believe it or not, I was a wee little lad, five years old in kindergarten. But some of you were. And I can't help but think, though, that it may have felt a little bit like those 331 folks and all the people who didn't get a vote and were with them. I can't help but think that it felt a little bit like they were saying to Jesus, we saw that church doing some good work up there in Williams in your name, and we tried to stop them because they weren't with us. They weren't like us. Believe it or not, folks still say that. Doesn't it feel just a bit like that? Of course, we, uh, the folks at Williams, would never find ourselves on the giving end of that now, would we? Not like those first disciples of Jesus, right? Now, Mark, Mark, as he so often doesn't do, doesn't give us a ton of narrative detail here. He doesn't tell us what transpired. Although I do think it's telling that, that he places this scene in the same line with the disciples' argument about who really is the greatest, most extra best, special disciple. But Mark doesn't really let us in on the details of this encounter with this rogue exorcist or what it was that prompted John to tell Jesus about it. Maybe, maybe they just wanted to try to sound holier, to sound purer in contrast to this person whom Jesus obviously didn't know. I do wonder though, what prompted the whole thing? What caused this whole thing to transpire, this story from John? Why are these disciples felt that they just had to shut that guy up? Why did they feel like they had to stop him? Maybe they were on a working lunch break. That's what I like to think. A collective debriefing of the work Jesus had sent them out to do. If you read back just a couple of chapters, a few chapters in chapter 6, Jesus, it says there, began to send them out two by two, gave them authority over the unclean spirits, so that they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons, anointed many with oil who were sick and cured them. Jesus sent them out. I like to think the twelve had come together, maybe more, had a cup of coffee, maybe over a sandwich, talking about what had gone on. And as they had finished up lunch and were leaving the restaurant, laughing about that one time in that one place, when that one guy said that one thing... They saw him. There he was, across the street, surrounded by a bunch of folks, casting out demons. Maybe he was wearing a cross around his neck. Maybe he had on a WWJD bracelet. Might have had a black leather Bible in his hand. But there he was, casting out demons. Doing the work that Jesus had sent them to do. So maybe, maybe it was jealousy that caused them to stop the man. I mean, John doesn't say he was trying to cast out demons. John doesn't say, Jesus, we tried to stop him because he was doing this. and wanted to. No, he was actually doing it. He was casting out demons. And if you look just a, a few verses back in chapter 9, you'll read a story about where a man comes to Jesus 
Says, teacher, I brought you my son. He has a spirit that makes him unable to speak. And whenever it sees at him, it dashes him down. He foams at the mouth. He grinds his teeth. He becomes stiff as a board. And then the man says to Jesus, I asked your disciples to cast it out. But they could not. Surely, surely Jesus' disciples don't stop this man because it looks like he's doing the actual work they're supposed to be doing, right? I mean, surely they don't do that. I mean, that's not the kind of thing that happens today either, is it? People don't get jealous about somebody doing something they're supposed to do and try to stop them, do they? I recently read a story a friend of mine sent me about another pastor, not too, too much older than I, who had been uh, serving a small congregation right out of seminary. He'd done his best while he was there. When he arrived to the church, they had about 50 or 60 folks meeting every Sunday morning. Most of them were, let's just say, card-carrying members of AARP. They were a little older. And through his work, through his ministry, through his leadership, church began to show signs of growth. They were up to about 80, 85 on Sunday morning, had baptized 12 in a matter of years. Church folks couldn't remember the last time they had baptized that many people. But, and there's always a but, there were some in the church who, well, they didn't like the preacher. They heard that he likes to have a craft beer every once in a while, and that's a sin among Baptists, you know. They heard that he likes to watch television shows that they didn't think were right or good. And some of them just didn't like him, didn't like the way he preached, didn't like the way he dressed. And so they decided that they were going to get rid of him, make his life miserable. Claimed to folks in and outside the church that the church was falling apart, contrary to the evidence around them and the waters in the baptistry. They would constantly call him at home complaining about everything. He'd be at dinner and somebody would call and say, Preacher, I'm mad. Somebody moved the painting out of my Sunday school room. Where'd they move it to? To the floor. Can't hang it back up by themselves. Called him when he was on vacation and he had had it. One member of this little committee, this little group had decided, you know what, you know what will get rid of him? Let's say he's having an affair. That'll do it. We don't even have to make it right. Just say it. That'll do it. So he decided he'd had enough, decided he was fed up, and the church was either going to get his resignation or his dead body. And so his son came into the office and found him tying a noose one Sunday morning before Sunday school. They got his resignation. Few folks were jealous because the church was growing and they had nothing to do with it because they didn't like the pastor. Surely Jesus' disciples weren't that way. Surely they didn't stop this man because it looked like he was doing the actual work they were supposed to be doing, right? Surely they weren't embarrassed, envious, or frustrated because he was doing what they were supposed to be doing, right? Right? Because they thought that his success ultimately meant their failure. Surely not. Not the disciples of Jesus. Well, maybe, maybe that's not it. Maybe they just didn't think he was doing it the right way. After all, there's a right way and a wrong way to do things, isn't there? I mean, you've got to follow the guidebook. It's stick with tradition. You've got to you have the right technique, the tried and true methods of success. You can't go off script. You can't go off the beaten path. You can't go following the Spirit on your own way, especially not when it comes to the Lord's work. There are right and wrong ways to do it. It's like that time I was at a backyard Bible club. Y'all know what those are? I like to call them dollar store VBSs. That's really what they are. Backyard Bible. I was sitting beside this little boy during craft time. They were making uh, these things called salvation bracelets. Maybe you've heard of them. Take a little piece of string or leather, put little colored beads. They all mean something. Black is sin. Red is Jesus' blood. Blue is bad. That sort of thing, you know. They're supposed to represent the plan of salvation or something. Anyhow, this boy proceeds to take his string and, well, he puts a pink one on and a blue one. A little unicorn, a little silver bead, something like that. Teacher stops the whole thing. 
That's not right. That's not what you're supposed to be doing. That's not the way it is. You're doing it wrong. And little boy says, I was just making it for my mama. She said, but you're not going to be able to tell anybody about Jesus. I feel pretty sure he could tell his mama about Jesus. Maybe this guy, this exorcist, just isn't doing it right. Maybe, maybe he had given the exorcism but didn't give an invitation. Because, you know, that's somewhere in Scripture. Wherever two or more are gathered, you've got to have an invitation somewhere. Maybe, maybe he didn't say, in Jesus' name. I remember there was an old man at my home church. He would say, God doesn't hear your prayer unless you end it with, in Jesus' name. Maybe that's what it was. Maybe he was from the wrong part of town was wearing the wrong clothes, might have had on one of them red caps that said, Make America Great Again. Maybe he was wearing a shirt that said, Hillary, 2016. I don't know. Maybe he was with the wrong groups. Or heaven forbid, he was from the wrong school. I mean, you go in the wrong part of town, you wear a crimson shirt with an A on it, or a blue and orange shirt, you might, no. Either way, he was doing it the wrong way. And you got to do things the right way, right? But Jesus doesn't seem to think so. Do not stop him. That's not what I was expecting Jesus to say. I expected Jesus to say, good job, you stopped him. That's not what he said. Do not stop him. For no one who does a deed of power in my name will soon be afterward able to speak evil of me. If he's doing it for the right reason, if he's really doing it in my name, he won't be able to do it long the wrong way. He won't be able to speak ill of me, to take advantage of others, to lead folks too far down the wrong path. After all, Jesus says, whoever is not against us is for us. Now, I want you to pay careful attention. Pay careful attention to the syntax of that statement. The order of those words. Notice, Jesus does not say, whoever is not for us is against us. He doesn't say that. No, that implies that everyone's got to be alike. On the same page, conform to the same standards of one another. What Jesus says is whoever is not against us is for us. That implies that there are folks who aren't in the same category, who aren't doing the same things the same way, who don't believe all the same things, who don't think all the same ways as one another, who are in fact for Jesus. Whoever is not against us, Jesus says, is for us. But I can't help but wonder then why so many of his followers are now so eager to find somebody to be against. I suppose there's some comfort, some strange comfort in having someone to call the other, someone to be against. I suppose if you can point a finger at someone who's different, someone you judge to be outside the purview of what is accepted, there may be a temptation to believe that you yourself are somehow better than they are. And I guess we need to find those Those folks from time to time whom we're against, or those who we think are against us, so that we can name someone, something, some movement as an enemy, as a target for our own deflected sense of failure. Someone upon whom we can throw our fears, frustrations, and anxieties. It's an age-old practice, really. We can go all the way back through human history. When things weren't really going all that well in the Roman Empire under Nero, he set the place on fire and blame the Christians. When once wealthy white slave owners in the South began to lose money after the Civil War, it was all too easy just to place the blame on the newly freed slaves, to dehumanize them, to create a narrative that's fueled hate to this very day. And when the Germans couldn't, couldn't come back to prosperity after World War I, the Nationalist Socialist Party and its charismatic leader Adolf Hitler focused the blame on the Jewish people of Germany, claiming that they were at the heart of a conspiracy to take over the world and the German homeland. It seems to me that it's just almost woven in the DNA 
of every human being. When things don't go the way we want them, when someone else seems to be thriving while we're staying still or maybe even declining, we label them as other, as outsiders disrupting our way of life, or worst of all, worst of all, we call them enemies and we fight them. Now, I don't think the disciples in this story intend to fight this other exorcist, but I do think they saw him as an easy way to focus their frustrations with their own failures. And I think Jesus knows that's what's at the heart of their confession here. I think that's why he says to them, For truly I tell you, whoever gives a cup of water to drink gives you a cup of water to drink, because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. What does that mean? It means that the line of fellowship, the line of cooperation is drawn not by shared beliefs, doctrines, or interpretations, but by the very acts of care, generosity, and love. After all, if anyone is really against us, if anyone is really attempting to thwart the good work of Christ that Christ is calling us to do in transforming this world in the lived-in reality of God's love, If anyone is really holding us up from what Jesus can call us to do, it's us. We're the ones, the only ones, who hold the power to prevent us from sharing God's love with the world, from doing the work to which Christ has called us. And it's us. Us, the ones who are so quick to call on Jesus' name, who are responsible for making sure that others are empowered and encouraged in doing the good work of Christ. That's exactly why Jesus says, if any of you put a stumbling block, if any of you scandalize one of these little ones who believe in me, it'd be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. In other words, if any of you think you're doing my work and you call someone else to give it up, to quit, to question the work they're doing and the nature of their relationship to the one who's called them to do it, it'd be better for you to be drugged down into the ocean and drowned. Harsh words. But we can get caught up, can't we? In believing that what matters is whether or not others are doing it right. Whether or not others are living the way we think they ought to be living. Whether others are falling in line with our understanding of Scripture, our understanding of the world, our understanding of a life well lived. We can get so caught up in how someone else offends us or our sensibilities that we forget that the worst offender is us. And that's the point. That's the point of these gruesome graphic words from Jesus. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go to hell to the unquenchable fire. If your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell. If your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and to be thrown into hell where their worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. Can I tell you something? I've known a lot of so-called fundamentalists in my life. A lot of people who will tell you up one way and down the other. You take the Bible literally, word for word. Can I tell you something else? Every last one of them have both hands, both feet, and both eyes. Now, I think there are some folks who can get caught up in all this Jesus talking about hell, the word Gehenna there, a fire that never quenches and all that jazz, as if this is some great proclamation by Jesus about eternal, conscious, physical torment. But what's at the heart of his words is a deeper, more sobering truth. Because yes, Jesus talks about fire, about somebody being thrown whole hog into hell, and that's, that's actually the point, the whole of a person. That this fire that Jesus talks about is for those who are so concerned for their own well-being, so convinced of their own self-righteousness, that they refuse to separate themselves from it. That they refuse and are therefore separated from God because they prefer to be separate from others. Others they are so deeply convinced are themselves deserving of separation in hell. It's to them and to us that Jesus says, everyone... Do you know what that word means in Greek, everyone? Everyone. Everyone will be salted with fire. 
Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves, Jesus says, and be at peace with one another. In other words, everybody gets a little taste of the fire, for it burns away our ignorance and our selfishness, seasoning us in the saltiness of Christ's love and the peace that can only come when we stop looking for the differences in others, for their shortcomings, the ways they don't fit, the ways they are out of line with our expectations, the peace that can only come when we realize that those who aren't against us are for us. And there are more people who are for us than we can ever imagine. Included in their ranks is Christ himself. Whoever isn't against us is for us. Christ himself for us. Whenever we look around for those who are against us, may we remember that. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us, Lord, when we are quick to point out those who are different. Believing, Lord, that we should stop them. God, help us to learn from the words of Scripture. You call us to be salted with your love, to be at peace with one another. Lord, we know and understand that peace can only come from you. So, Holy Spirit, we pray it comes, that it comes quickly. And may it start with us, those gathered in this place who call now on your name. Move in our presence, Holy Spirit, we pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.